It's a good day to jack it out. Episode 29. That's a very radio-esque intro I just did. Like, I kind of wanted it to just, like, echo out of my mouth and just be like, 20 knot, 9, 9, 9, 9. <laughs> Turn it up and rip the knob off. It's jack it off. And Maybe it I feels, should... and it feels. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was watching, uh, I don't know if you've ever watched it, but the, uh, the, Tom, the Tom Segura podcast. I told you I list or I watched his stand up, the the newest Tom Segura stand up. He's sure. so fucking good, it's crazy. But he does a uh, he does a, a podcast with his wife, who's also a comedian, and it's called Your Mom's House. I can't recommend that podcast enough. They play it like that. They play it like it's a fucking radio, like real real shitty. Like Z morning um, zoo. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah it's it's not uh, not Opie and anthony but like like bob and tom they play it like bob and tom where there's like a shitload of fucking uh inside jokes and like references to shit it's great like he's got one of those interfaces on his laptop where he can just trigger all the sounds he's got like a billion sounds in it and he just takes them for viral right? videos well no it's like a custom thing because obviously you're not just going to get a turnkey like soundboard but he like has a guy engineer all of this stuff like they'll do one podcast they'll play a bunch of videos and then they'll hand it over to the engineer afterwards and he'll rip out a bunch of different shit for him to fucking just put in there so he could trigger it so from the last episode to the next one he's got like five new sounds or like people saying shit and it's like one of them is like a thing where he takes like um <clears throat> He takes like clips from pornos, the the intros, like the really really bad porno intros with really horrible acting. One of them was, uh, "Hi, I'm Peyton Lafferty, and I'm a ball hawk." <laughs> and he just now has everybody who follows his podcast twittering to him with just like vine length videos of them How being like, "I'm Brent you? Pickard, and I'm a ball hog." How old are you? What twittering to him? Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I used a word that fucking whatever. These kids, they use the Twitter and they Twitter at this guy. I don't understand it. I'm sorry that suddenly Facebooking is a verb. You could use the word Facebooking, but apparently Twittering isn't. No, tweeting is. Because the, oh, excuse me, whatever. The what are you shorten Facebook into? I'm FBing, bro. I'm Nothing. Fl- See, the I'm thing about flipping. Twitter, the Twitter is you tweet. That's what you do. Whatever. The act of, the act of doing that is, now, is defined by Twitter. Adjectives. It's defined by Twitter. Proper nouns, conjugation, language. <laughs> anyway. A bunch of people were tweeting at Tom Segura with fucking fine length videos of them saying the shit that he says on his show, and I feel like that would be great if we had people that watched. No. Also, he has this. We we say nothing that bears repeating, Brent. Well, no, no, no. I'm saying other people do. See, that's the that's the crux of the show, is that he is a comedian and he is naturally funny, but he's like me in that. I like to put things on screens, riff to them, or, like, try to get somebody on board with, like, a viral video or some bullshit. That's that's what I'm all about. That's my thing. That's my deal. Oh, is it? I have have friends over, and we all get high and watch weird YouTube videos. Mm, That's why they never come over again. Mm. You want to go to Brent's house? No, I don't feel like this until I talk. Period. (laughs) I feel like in some way he's just continually continually blathering on about some shit that he likes. And I've seen it a million fucking times, dude. I don't know where that comes from. Like, ever since the beginning of college, it's like, Brent goes over to a fucking party. What happens? Oh, okay. He's going to play the same music over and over again. <laughs> He'll play the same shit over and over again. Because it's good. Because I'm drunk. Because I want to listen to that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if all I want to listen to is This Is War when I'm drunk. You know, like, the select tracks I like from This Is War. I'm sorry if all I want to listen to is This Is War, period. <laughs> from beginning to end. I mean, I'll do that on my own time. I'm not gonna, I'm not over here to try to bore you with some of those tracks in between that are a little bit. I mean, I like the whole record. It makes the album, dude. It makes the album. You gotta stick with it. 
the pretentious guy who's just like, I, I don't understand why people don't listen to whole records anymore. What happened to the vinyl experience of the LP? Maybe I am I that guy? <laughs> I don't think I've ever made that point before. No, but. you're not that guy. You just play this. You, you your vinyl LP is just the same ten songs over and over again. It's Brent's custom playlist on Spotify every single year <laughs> when the when they do that aggregation of your like you know your top songs of 2017 to 2018. I have both of them, and I I follow them every year just to see like where there are songs that like repeat. Oh yeah, throughout I get that because too. I'll go, I'll go on to, I'll be playing my 2018 or 2017 playlist, and this is from. So I'll be listening to these songs in 2016, and then they'll create the best of 2016, and then I'll listen to all of those songs because I liked them then and I like them now, and then that shit just you just you just listen listening to the 2017 playlist over and over again. <laughs> it's like I enjoy the things I remember. <laughs> It's like, oh, fuck finding new music, dude. It's all about last year's music. I don't give a fuck what's going on right now. My 2018 was like, the whole brand new album was on there. <laughs> the whole Taylor Swift album was on there. <laughs> mine was, uh, mine since the album came out was that second record by the 1975. Over the course of 2016 and 20, or no, 2017 and... Yeah, 2016, 2017. Uh, I have like five of the tracks on that album repeated yep. throughout those two years, and they just keep repeating. Keep rolling them. I'm I never have... going to get these songs. <laughs> We're going to play these five songs when they lower me into my grave. <laughs> uh, like the the fucking she- the the idea behind it for me is that this is the first step in a long descent of becoming old and not liking the music that is coming out now. Whereas three or four years previous to this, I've sort of thought I'm always going to be hip dude. I'm always going to be up on what the kids like. I went to a goddamn marshmallow concert the other week. I know what the kids like. I like, you know, the kids like me. We all like the kids. <laughs> I like touching kids, and kids like, like touching me. You know, me. when I'm in a concert, I like dancing up on the kids and having a good time with the kids. You know, gotta check for those wristbands. So <laughs> make sure they're over age. <laughs> Snappity snap snap. <laughs> Wristband, show it to me. But I, but what it's indicating is that the the re, the repetition of these songs year to year like as we're going seems to be leaning more and more towards the fact that like I'm eliminating like a bunch of like, I'm eliminating a bunch of things that sort of are of the moment and then I'm just holding on to all of these other fucking songs that sort of just keep repeating every year, and what's going to happen is, well, see, well, see, you get, you still get some of the new songs that that get bunched up into the, the keep repeating songs, so that ball gets a little bigger, <clears throat> but just a lot of the newer stuff just falls off the ball. It's like a Katamari ball, you're rolling <laughs> it along. <clears throat> some songs stick to it and make your ball a little bigger, but other things just fall off. They're too big for what you, bro. Me- what it makes me wonder is like what is the decade that I'm going to be talking about when I'm 60 I, know, I hope you're talking to yourself because I don't want to fucking hear it what <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm just talking to myself over here trying to work out these trying to work out these topics before I give them to you no I'm talking about when you're 60 Oh, <laughs> I hope you're talking to yourself I thought you were saying that you thought you hoped I was talking to myself because my fucking topic was stupid or something. No, no, no. Um, if I am talking to myself when I'm 60, what I'm wondering is what records, albums, and songs am I going to be talking to myself about <laughs> when I'm 60? Like the like the idea that the idea that I would maybe be able to find myself in 30. 30 or 40 years saying saying the words uh now skrillex that was real music (laughs) it's fucking beyond me 
I can't think in my head of that being a valid argument. Or like, I mean, I guess I can't even think of a band that that seems like it would just last that long. In like, you know, when I think about things from the fucking from the seventies, I think we right now we're in the liking seventies and eighties. Maybe actually, I think the seventies is out of it. I think we're in the liking eighties, nineties right now. That's like where we're where I'm constantly going back to. I mean, right now I'm trying to fucking make a record that's nineties house music. And that's the shit I like. 90s. I gotta hear them fucking tubular bells. I gotta hear the tubular bells and the 909s and all that shit. It just seems like... Um, if I were to talk about... Like, it, it might it might be happening in the next... It might be happening... It happened already. It might be what I liked in high school. I might find myself saying something like... My Chemical Romance, now that's a real band! Isn't that how it works? I don't know because it just seems weird that I wonder if somebody in the 70s or 80s thought to themselves oh my god I can't believe in 40, 30 or 40 years I'm going to be telling my kids that the Rolling Stones now that's real music and it's like at the time you think that you're the most revolutionary thinker in the world because you found the Rolling Stones I don't even know if that'd be a very good example because they were so popular but like I don't know Am I going to be like, am I going to be like, oh man, you haven't heard music until somebody straps a fucking marshmallow bucket to their head and presses play in front of a bunch of lasers. That's real music. Don't worry. Uh, You'll be dead by 30 or 40 years. Uh, so you don't got to worry. The about hope it, is, is that that's the dream. The hope is, is that I fade into the ether. And none of these problems will even exist. <laughs> The, the the vastly important problem of what music is going to be relevant 30 years from now or 30 years in the past is just... Washed away. It's just a fucking blip on the fucking radar, dude. Like the rest of the world in a nuclear holocaust. Welcome to the existential crisis cast. <laughs> we out here. Unfortunately. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. <laughs> the existential crisis podcast. Turn it up and feel sorry for yourself. Anyway. As you adjust. Create your adjustment. Oh, you got your pen. I got my pencil. I found a pencil. I'm in an artist studio, so I got a pencil. Give me something to write on. Give me something to write on, man. <laughs> The end of that just sounded like I took like a huge fucking like cloud going in my mouth. Give me some to run on, dude. Is that you, Snuffleupagus? Um. So here's here's the four. <laughs> here's, you want to see the four things that I have on my list? Let's go. Let's start with number the one. The first one. The first one is. Kevin Smith heart attack. Let's raise the let's raise the the fucking the mood in here. Let's get the mood up to the roof and talk about Kevin Smith's heart attack. That's easy to do. Okay. Uh kind of fucked up what he said. <laughs> like he he in very similar fashion to like, you know, 90% of what he does now basically was just like had a good run, man. It did clerks oh okay th cool kev i know you've done clerks because every single podcast i've ever listened to you in history said i'm the guy that did clerks yep okay cool so like i did clerks and then like i almost had a heart attack or i had a heart attack and I almost died so it's like i did everything that i want to do that's pretty much it <laughs> that's that's kevin Smith's reaction to like everything Something sad happens. I did clerks, so you know what? Everything's good, man. Something bad happened in the world? Clerks, dude. Um. So, yeah. That was it. That was just my soundbite about uh, That's, that. Was it. That was your, fucking heart attack. Your hot take? I hope he has many, many more heart years. attacks. <laughs> many, many more heart attacks. He lives attacks. through many more heart attacks. And then, then maybe that'll get him to stop talking about clerks, as if he has a few more heart attacks, and he's just like, "All right, something's going on here. I think I got some sort of curse where I can't talk about that movie without getting a heart attack." I don't think he talks about that much, does he? 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, do you, you don't really listen to like, neither of us really listen to Smodcast or, um, or like any of his other shows on the regular now, do you or no? No, not really. Like I listen to him every once in a while just to see what's going on there. And it's become like a weird, I mean, Smodcast itself has become like something real weird. And like Scott Mosier is just pretty much done with it. I can definitely tell he's he's probably on his way out. He's been in like Paris shooting movies and shit. I was gonna say he's he's not even on that many anymore. So he's like I think almost at this point he's probably out. But the but the point is is that um, his newest shit is just a it's just kind of like a revolving door of talking about like his achievements right now and things that he's working on with other people and having like weird guest spots and appearances where it's not even really like he's interviewing someone. It's just that they're like plugging something very explicitly like Macaulay Culkin and this fucking somebody else were on there the other day, plugging their podcast. And then sometimes in that, the slot of Smodcast, he'll just play some like live event thing that he had or like a live pod. That's just random has nothing to do with, Smodcast. I just, I don't know. I don't know. It's weird. I guess when you talk for all of your life, you start to double back on some shit. He's, I think he's so, he's so weirdly self-aware on some of these things that he would have probably just said that himself <laughs> after this heart attack thing where he's just like, I've been talking for fucking 20 goddamn years. I don't know how much more to to fucking talk about. So then you start getting a little bit like meta and self-referential and weird and making weird movies that are just like so off the fucking chart and off the wall. So next thing. <laughs> uh... Right, right on. I'm right, right on it. Rapid right, just fire. Keep moving. Rapid fire, you know. Rapido. Rapida? Rapido? Rapidash? I'm the leg. I'm the leg. <laughs> um, vaping. What? I wrote, the word, I wrote the word vaping down here. Great. Let's talk about uh, this newest, hottest trend. <laughs> You're going to Twitter about your va this new vaping rig? <laughs> This is the hottest new thing right now. <laughs> Twittering about your vaping fidget spinners. Your fidget spinner vape. Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it's for a practical reason this time, okay. I swear. Go for it. <laughs> I um, I told you on last week's show that I had been doing some CBD tinctures. Right. Pretty much snake oil. Yeah. I'll just report back to you on that finding. Uh, doesn't have anything to do with what's in it. It's just because that's just the stupidest way to do it. <laughs> it doesn't you you just metabolize it and then you're going about your day. That's you know what you should it. do? Get addicted to painkillers. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be, but it'll be classy like House, right? Like I'll be like a, I'll be a lovable scamp. Yeah, yeah, or like Tom DeLonge or something. Uh, yeah, that's actually probably more the model that I'm sort of looking at is is tom and just his uh his overall demeanor i think i want to emulate that i just want to be like talking about stuff all the time and like you know making like weird movements and stuff that's that that'd be my shtick that'd be my thing dude they got like a fucking alien base bro they do it's huge it's bigger than fucking alpha centauri you ever heard of alpha centauri <laughs> It's where the fucking aliens are at, bod. I'm gonna go get some za. You wanna come? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? Like that reminds me. There's like space za. <laughs> That's like a whole thing. Space za, bro, dude. Great. I don't. I don't know why it devolved into like. Uh... Cause I was going for his very specific Southern California accent, but then it just evolved into the normal one. Yeah. Well, that one's, e that, that one's easier to do. Right. Yeah, I can't. It's hard for me to do. It's hard for me to do some of the things he says. <clears throat> I loved it when they did that documentary about the um, about the making of. Oh God, I can't even remember what album it is. We don't need a whisper. No, it's 
later than that when he started getting indie. What was the one where he started getting real indie with it? Um, fuck. Oh, the, like the the web webumentary, the one they did online. Yeah, I think so. It was with that new guitarist that he got. It was the Dreamwalker. Was... Yeah, it was the Dreamwalker. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was it. Well, it wasn't the new guitar? It was. He's just. Wasn't it Chris Renner? I want to say it was Chris Renner from Nine Inch Nails who was the no, one. No, he they was. Got he that wasn't one. Nine Inch Nails. It was uh, Ru Ruben Ru. Oh God! E I Ian Rubin, remember. Ian Rubin, or yes, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. E Elon. The record that he helped produce with them. Yeah, I loved in that series when he was playing something and he goes. He was, I think he was just doing it acoustic and he got got through the line, and he's like, "Uh, it's mine, not mine, mine. It's not. It's mine, not mine." <laughs> He was the first time I'd ever heard anybody who was recording with. I mean, it, it had to have happened more than that, but it was the first time I'd ever heard anybody recording with Tom DeLonge. They called him on the fucking weird like oys that he's got in like ninety percent of his speech pattern. Um, like here I am. Like, no, no, no. It's I, I, I. No, no, no. I. That's how to say it. That's how you say it. Um, I veered completely so far away from what I had talked about before. We just va suddenly it was vaping. I thought we were talking and about painkillers. Suddenly pain we got to fucking <laughs> angels and airwaves. Is that kind of like the Hitler game where you start talking about something? It's always going to go to Hitler. It's like you start talking about something. It's always going to go to angels and airwaves. I mean, if you want, I could do that. Yeah, I could do it. Too. I'll get I mean, you there. Seven degrees of, of angels and airwaves. I'll get you there in two. <laughs> what are we talking about right now? Cookies? Okay, I can probably figure that out. We could get from cookies to angels and airwaves. All right, vaping. The hot uh, new trend. The hot, the hot thing that get all the kids a jewel. Are doing right now. Uh, actually, I got a knockoff of a jewel. Not a knockoff, not but surprised. like a re. It, well, it was a rework from a different company it has a similar style to it um but uh yeah that was what i i think it was called it's from candy pens Great. candy pens is a pretty well-known vape thing i guess i really don't know anything that's the thing i've never in my life when i was researching something found so many fucking did it for longer than to, 10 minutes I, the what I was expecting in my mind is if I was like I, I wanted to make the decision as cut and dry as possible. Easy easy, cheap, relatively good mid range vape. I'm like, ah, oh, I could find that online. It'll take me ten seconds. Boom. Three hours later. I got fucking four hundred tabs open. I'm like, all right. Best vapes twenty eighteen. All right, that doesn't give me anything. Let's see. Uh, best uh, low-profile, cheap... Oh, fuck, where the fuck am I? What am I doing? So, ended up deciding on this thing and bought myself some vape juice. Once again, you know, with CBD in it because apparently this is the only best way to do it. It's fucking was talking to one of my co-workers and one day and this confirmed my suspicion you ever get your con suspicions confirmed and you feel like Columbo you're just like yeah I figured it out just in real life shit you feel like a fucking detective you feel like Batman I was talking to um I was talking to one of my co-workers and he, he was in my office and he got a little like kind of close to me you ever, you ever have somebody just get like real, real close to you? Yeah, I don't like it. And then, yeah, that ain't gonna happen for me. I mean, there's a limit. It's, you know, it's, I don't know where it is, but it's somewhere in here. It's in, it's in the you know. If you're coming for a kiss, length. commit, dude. So like, he gets a little close to me. I'm standing at my desk. He's kind of just like, yeah, gets a little, gets in here. Yeah, I get a little, whiff, you know, I get a little whiff of something. And I'm just like, all right, dude. That might be happening outside school hours. I'd be smoking in the boys' room a little bit. And then um, later on, I was like, I was telling my other coworker, I'm like, I think Brandon might smoke weed. <laughs> you fucking gotta, narc. Gotta be, it's got to be a Brandon, doesn't it? No, that's to, that's to protect his name. That's to protect his name. That's to, to protect the identity of those oh, involved. You snitching with another coworker. Oh, that part of it? Fuck, yeah. Fuck, it's starting the rumor mill, Sally. 
The office Sally. Dude, the only thing to do in, the, in an office to keep yourself from killing yourself is to start office gossip. That's hey, why. That's why I think exists. Joey smokes weed. You think he sells it? You think he's a drug dealer? Check all the cops. <laughs> Am I a cop? <laughs> just like the minute that I find out somebody at work's like smoking weed or whatever, it's just like, oh, that's terrible. Do you know where he gets it from? I mean, not that I want. I'm There's just so saying, many places. Like, if I, I just want don't want it to happen. Not in my backyard. You know what I mean? So I just want to know. You it's know, to make sure it's not in my backyard. Is it in I, my backyard? I'm trying to look. I look. Um, I look out my window. I can backyard. see in my backyard. I got land. Just let me know, bro. Let me know. Meanwhile, you know, it's, just give him the cold words. All those cool cold words that all the kids use. I put on a green sweater today. How about you? Did you put on a green sweater? You got some ice cream, bro. Some fucking ice cream sandwiches, bro. That's about the only two that I use and know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if those are real. Ice cream, ice cream is the one I use kind of in my own sort of very limited circle. And then, um, uh, I think green sweater. Where the fuck did I get that from? Jesus, I'm almost positive I got that from Andrew. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Pretty sure that's where I got green sweater from. Either that or the other one was, uh, he was like, he did the, he did the cliche one where he was like, you hold and call field. <laughs> <laughs> Like, huh, that's a literary <laughs> reference. <laughs> Read that book in high school. <laughs> that one did a book report that, on it. Got that, a B plus. That one with the government. <laughs> <laughs> it's about thoughts, man. It's about your thoughts and fucking how y you feel. Yeah, I know. You read a book. Congratulations. <laughs> you read Ayn Rand. Good, good for you. You're a you're a humanist or a fucking singularist or a god whatever the fuck you are, because you read Ayn Rand. I think it starts with a C. <laughs> um, uh, well, no, in the book it's something, but I but what Ayn Rand is as a person is an individualist. That's what that's oh. what it, they're saying. I was she thinking was. a cunt. That's what. That's what I can see. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who reads this book is a word that starts with a C. <laughs> Communist? No, that's not it. Shorter. <laughs> um. Uh. It's all about that vaping. It's all about the vaping. All right. Next week next, I'll be next, next week I'll be pulling fucking huge clouds, just blocking the camera. Look at a goddamn haunted house on your end. <laughs> Anyway, um, the next thing I have written is just very generally music production. Oh my god! Why? <laughs> generally, whatever, man. It's just general. It's all about general topics. We're a variety show. We're like Donnie and Marie. We're like Howdy Doody. We're the modern day Howdy Doody. Next up, we got Conway Twitty. He's going to come on and do a little performance for us. We got puppets. All different kinds of shit. We got the colored boy that can juggle. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> it, was like a, it was like a racist softball just hitting right in the was, head. I was waiting for it, man. I, I had to get it in. <laughs> Jeez. <clears throat> anyway... <laughs> Before I send Grandpa back to the old folks' home for being too racist. No, he's real good at it, though. <laughs> you don't understand. He's epic, dude. You gotta watch it. The juggles fried chickens. <laughs> waka waka. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, good lord. Cut that right out. <laughs> <laughs> Cut the whole fucking thing out. <laughs> Cut it out from when I cut it out from when I like smoked like an hour ago, and now I'm just I'm ranting make, like, like uh, a Uncle lunatic. Joey and cut it out. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ! 
Just, just dial on my references up in time. Oh, you see that? Yeah, dude, your references are out of control. Everybody I was, knows I was, that. I was dialing, dialing them up and bringing them back to normal times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was trying to... You know what song I've had in my fucking head all goddamn day? Is fucking Show Me Love by Robin S. It's been in my head a million times. Like, oh, and also The King of Wishful Thinking by Go West. That's a great tune, dude. Put that song on and pretend like you haven't been teleported back to the 80s and you're on the back of a motorcycle. That you, or you're in a fucking drop top, drop top baby blue fucking convertible driving down the Sunset Strip. Rain that's top. that's the song. It's totally that. That's what it makes you feel like. You'd think that you're in like Beverly Hills Cop. So, Robin S, Go West. I got that whole playlist going of shit. The other day, I fucking blew somebody's mind. We were playing fucking. Uh, You've we now talked about of... this playlist in three consecutive podcasts. Yeah, dude. I'm just continually putting together. It's 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 no big deal, dude. We were watching weird videos on YouTube, and I was like, I started playing. Hey, this do song. you know who this is? Yes, exactly. Ooh. I hit him with the "Do you know who this is?" But their guess was great. Uh, it was a song missing by popular Euro pop trashy dance group, Everything But the Girl. And most people know this song is, and I miss you like the desert miss the rain, and I miss you, yeah. That song, right? We all know that song. Everybody thinks it's called Desert or like the desert, some desert, desert shit. I'm, it's called I Miss You. Um, everybody thought it was Annie Lennox. And I was like, that's a great guess, but that's not it. But it's wrong. Oh, I'm Brent here to tell you you're wrong. Oh, look I'm at here. me. I'm, this is my game I show. I'm going to fucking ask the questions, bitch. <clears throat> um, I just thought that was interesting that there are so many songs that There's we a lot think of songs. we know. There's that a we lot think of songs. A is. lot of songs. Yeah, thanks, Spotify, for there showing me a lot, lot of songs. Of songs. Exactly. Not even all of them are on Spotify. There's even more songs that some are on Spotify. Some of them are just hanging out in a fucking record store. It's just like a vinyl with some like Ukrainian guy. A lot guy of on songs. Uh, then you got fucking listen, India, China. You know how many Korea, songs? K-pop, dude. Shit's blowing up. We don't do even you know, know how what's many going songs. On a I lot. know all the songs. All right, what a do you want to talk about? Music production now. Let's... <laughs> you don't want to talk about it. You get you 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 about you about melted into a puddle when I said it before. I melt in a puddle every time you say something. Just what did you want to say about it? I just wrote it down because I wanted to incite a spirited conversation about perhaps the the overall influence or direction that we may or may not be both headed in in the creation of a possible record that's gonna suck. You know, whatever. <laughs> trying to figure out how, what I want to say about it. 60 minutes of pure suck. Mm. Um, side A sucks. <laughs> side B yeah, Decent still melodies sucky. still sucks. <laughs> um, mine's just going to be repetitive 90s house that has a bunch of drops and no like breaks or resolutions. That's all it's gonna be. We know we never talked about this on on a recording, so uh -huh. no one even knows what you're talking about. And well, and what? All right. I mean, but <laughs> you know, we're just talking as two people who talk every week that talk about stuff outside of this. But since we know that nobody on the outside of this is watching this. That's true. It's just an inside joke factory that's or an true. inside, you know, event factory. I didn't think it's of it like that. Things. Yeah. But listen, well, however cathartic this may be, if it did have an audience, you know, whatever. You just got to listen to it. You just because the, the idiocy of me saying something like 
for all the listeners at home, what I'm talking about is, is there's nobody there. There's nobody there, Brent. Why are you saying that? Why are you addressing? Cause you got to assume there's someone there, Brent. The the positive thinking involved with believing that you have more than one person who listens to this besides you. You know, who, you know, whatever. I don't listen to it. Um, I'd, I'd like to think that there's at least one person out there who's like, you could tell I don't listen to it by the way it's edited. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true too. You just like look for things that look very obviously wrong with the footage, and it's like, oh, I'm not in my chair. Maybe I should take yeah, that part cut out. That out. That's exactly what I do. Bam, you know, bam. That's, listen, that's called editing. Yeah. You're now a master editor. You just look for glaring issues in the production and just cut those out just by on the timeline. Don't even just look at it on the timeline and fucking blade that shit and throw it in the garbage. I use the term, I use the premier term, blading. Use the old blade. And blade the fuck out of this section of the podcast. <laughs> um, music production. Oh, geez. Oh, wow. That's all you had to say was just the words? Nope. Uh, I was heading there. I was, I was head. I was just saying that, like I said, wanted to have a discussion about. How do you feel about samples? Wow, (laughs) samples. I do feel a way about samples, and I feel like I want to. Uh, I want to get rid of them because I lean so heavily on usage of them, and it's weird because my tracks are not mastered or EQ'd very well. Like as I'm working on them, I don't really set much EQ. I don't really, uh, sometimes I turn things up certain stuff. Generally, I'm just like, it just needs to be more bassy. So I'll go into EQ and be able to make it more bassy. And then when I take these samples that are recorded by professional fucking recording artists and engineers and master from something like fucking splice or whatever i throw that in my track and it's like "Ah!" (laughs) it's like what am i doing wrong on my track everything's so fucking quiet it's like i'm recording in the 70s you need compressors just compressor on everything everything. put compressors and limiters every goddamn channel every fucking every track i i just i'm like recording it and i'm just like is that what it is is that the loudness war that we're all trying to fight right now is just compressors on top of compressors on top of reverbs and shit just fucking goes gets bigger and bigger and bigger yeah duh yeah that's what it is stupid ass so when i put a compressor laden fucking drop sample in my goddamn track it's like I, the whole track is exploding Instead of a slow, gradual build, it's just like, whoa, he's obviously doing something here. Because it's going, bleh. Over the rest of the track, the drums in the track are just like a fucking custom ultra beat shit that I made. That doesn't even, like the drums in it don't even match and they're just all over the fucking place. Buy a drum, buy a fucking drum VST. I say to myself, begrudgingly. And then don't do it. (laughs) And then I don't do it. And then I just go right back in, go on Ultra Beat, put a shitload of effects on one of the stupid Logic drums, and use that. Cool. Ugh. No, I, I gotta get a fucking, I gotta get, I, I gotta get some real. <laughs> I have to get real 909s, like an actually recognized 909 fucking thing that has good samples in it, and then a actually recognized keyboard that's just one keyboard. There's just one bank of sounds, and then I just focus on that. I was watching a fucking thing today on YouTube where this guy was talking about how he went and played a whole show with a fucking Casio rap man. <laughs> he goes, he was playing I Want to Dance with Somebody, and it was like real fucking toy piano bleepy bloop with the fucking scratch pad on it and the preset fucking sequence beats. And I was like, that's pretty fucking inspiring right there. Because what it was, was that the exercise in this was that he was exercising limitations on himself. Oh, see, that's the problem. See, I don't like I exercising. was thinking about it. I was thinking about it. That's such an easy joke. I was thinking it about works every it. time. <laughs> just, you picked it right, right like the low hanging fruit. There it is. I that's picked fresh. it. That's fresh. That's fresh fruit. 
Leave um, it up there too long, it'll rot, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's rotted. I, uh... What the hell was I saying? <laughs> uh, something about using simple is better. Oh, yeah, so the guy the guy in this channel was like, why, why am I doing this? And he's like, what happens is your blank, your blank page syndrome or your, whatever you want to call that, the anxiety of having just a blank workspace in front of you comes from the fact that you haven't limited your available resources to something that's more manageable and i was like i was like man that's gotta i mean that's gotta be a, a pretty large influence on this making music like in terms of if you if you put like it's kind of like cooking it's like if you if you just look in your fridge and you're just looking at it and you don't have a recipe you have nothing and you just open up your fridge and be like you just got fucking done grocery shopping and you're like the fuck do i make with all this versus going online while you're going grocery shopping onto a couple recipes that you want to do during the week grabbing all that shit putting that in the cart and then now when you get home the only things you have in your house are the ingredients that you're going to use to make those recipes visa v when you're making music you want to take the general tools that were used to make the style or the grouping of styles that your music is in and limit yourself to only those tools and have nothing else so thinking if i want to make a 90s house tribute ep i need the korg um and I can't m1 the, m1 couldn't remember the letter korg korg m1 fucking um rolling 909 vst you got it you got all the 90s right there and then everything sounds good it's sampled right from the original fucking instruments and then just run with that. That's enough. Like you got lots of patches on the M1. You got lots of options on the fucking 909 for just your basic drums. All the fucking five drums anyway. Your little your little shaky maraca and your fucking tubular bell and your goddamn like general lead synth and then just a big RB low bass. That's what you got. Boom. 90s. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna impose restrictions on myself. I can't. So that I don't find myself in the predicament of being in a room full of keyboards. Figuratively, Dylan. Figuratively. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Oh, I thought, I thought you were throwing shade. I thought you were talking about me. <laughs> oh, good thing you were. You, go, you were talking about digital keyboards. Right, right, right. Not I don't the... want to find myself in a room full of digital keyboards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and think, well... I could use this to update it. That was the other thing. Like I was sort of struggling with the dilemma of should I faithfully recreate this style and record a record that is inside of that era, like in it, or should I be trying to create something modern on top? But then I came back to the initial thought again, where I was like, I'll make myself panic if I just, spend all my time finding modern elements like patches and different types of synths that, that are from fit. now that fit that would fit into it because the style like if you're physically going so going back to the production thing of the 90s it is quiet it's not as quiet as anything before it we've just been continually getting louder but the 90s as far as dance music was concerned, it was flat and it was a very quiet. Yeah, you listening had, to it you, now. You had one sawtooth wave patch playing like the the main chords instead of you figure at least four layered patches like playing all the same thing at the same time, so it's like blasting you in the fucking face. That was the other problem that I had when I was trying to create modern music. Like, uh, where if I just sit down and I'm not thinking about, like, a record and I just bang out a riff on something, if I just find, like, the, the curse of it all 
is that you're in serum or whatever you pick a patch you start playing something on the patch and you're like oh that's cool I th- i'm gonna try to make something with that it's something that's either it's like something hard or growly or overly mixed or huge or whatever it is like that's a more modern way of looking at it i get that into a track and i put some drums b- below it and then i lose focus because it doesn't sound like i want it to sound as soon as i get this to get, like it's hard having an immediate an immediateness to music production when most of the stuff that you hear in the modern day now is these fucking huge layered productions where if you take a bunch of stuff away it's going to sound like shit so i'm starting in the sounds like shit category and i have to add layers to it to make it sound good or like what it is now and you know like if i want it to sound like fucking diplo or marshmallow or any of the any of the produce the the producers working today the 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 17 year old fucking bieber producers and all these like nameless faceless dudes they're using these techniques that i have no i don't have any bearing on but the beauty with the 90s is that the music to me in my mind when i'm listening to it when i'm listening to a very quintessentially 90s dance or techno track is that there is there aren't a lot of layers. There's yeah, it's, there's it's, it's the simple, there's this classic, very like, simple drum bass guitar, but it's drum but it's bass, electric. Yes. drum bass keyboard, drum bass chord so, melody. That's yeah. In a way, when you're listening to it, you can very distinctly hear the building blocks of it. Most of it is to do with arrangement and drum arrangement, like especially like thing beats that kind of fire off kilter a little bit. Like in Show Me Love, there's like a maraca in there that's kind of hard to place as you're building. Yeah. Like you're you're gonna start building the general drum pattern, which in in 128 or 120, whatever that song is, is just that's all that is is just. But then in the center, you got some shit that's like more trying to build and, like a texture and then like the it. downbeat on every four bars is like a, a clave hit or like a cowbell yeah. hit um and so like the structure of it's it's actually kind of misleading now having tried to make like it's weird having trying to make remake a song not necessarily where I'm doing a different version of the song or I'm changing the tempo of it or I'm changing the key. I'm literally just making the song in it so that different vocals could come over the top and maybe it just sounds a little bit more heavy. That's all it really is. It's just making Show Me Love sound a little heavier, a little more modern, and then maybe doing a different vocal over. That's how strict of a cover that is. Or at least in my mind it is. Before I start to get into the dilemma of should it sound like a modern version of Show Me Love. But that's been done. Like it that's that's they have that. In fact, I think the singer's name is Robin. Oh Robin. R R O B Y N. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um She does uh what uh Call Your Girlfriend and uh Dance With Myself yeah, and she was a yeah. background dancer for Katy Perry she falls into the category and this kind of leads into the modern discussion about this style of music but like she leads into that conversation like kiza um kiza and robin and uh there's a couple other um there's a couple other producers and artists that are approaching the that sound or you know like there's the there's a delineation between if you were making uh, what you would want to call like a 90s house record, maybe what you're really making is a future house record because future house is just 90s house with the what I'm talking about, the modern instrumentation of it. Most of it's like in like 128 and it's all using just the modern versions of all those instruments and some shininess. There's some shiny on it. I love that shine. There ain't nothing. There ain't fucking ain't nothing yeah. shiny about the '90s. There ain't nothing Polish. in there. It's, it all sounds Get like warm R&B type of shit. 
that turtle wax and microfiber thing and shine that motherfucker up. I mean, the shiniest, the absolute fucking shiniest producers out there are like fucking Griffin, Elenium, Marshmallow, and the more modern, they're in the more mainstream. Is They're the shiniest of the shiny. Like, that shit is so twinkly. Like, just little little twinkles. And then maybe in the more rock sense, the 1975 and Pale Waves and um, that band you showed me the other day that sounded like good chain smokers. That's, like, the real shiny shit oh, on, like, the other Lanny? side of the L-A-N-Y. Lanny. Yeah. There was another guy um, that's that's kind of in that same category, I think I linked to you, that was, like, b- b- um, b- fuck, it starts with a B. Um, I can't remember it, but I always, I keep thinking of bleachers, but bleachers is like that yeah, too. Yeah, bleachers is He's real shiny. Um, that was at first the kind of thought that I had about what record I wanted to make, but what I realized was that to do something like that is almost impossible. It's almost impossible to do it by yourself. You can't self-produce. Um, a guitar-driven uh, a guitar-driven like eighties. Twinkly I'll let you know VHS how it goes, Brent. <laughs> okay. Is that what you is that what you want to do? Do you want to be the next pale wave? Do you want to record a pale waves thing? Uh, I would have thought, thought for sure. It. I mean, if, to me, it could have been. It was. It was probably like a list of like three or four things that I thought it could have been, and what it, the, one of the first ones I was like, he's, he's going to do a synthwave record, do a, do a full. What, you know. what the three things you're thinking of? It was probably the three things I'm thinking of combining. So you wanted to combine synthwave and um, the Cure esque modern '80s Brit rock, sure, and. Um, maybe future base yeah or or the, so like where you have um i mean conceptually it would be interesting because if you th- if you wanted to use bands to describe it you could say that it was almost like um uh it was almost like an elenium remix of pale waves like where you have a song that has all of those like like those real like poppy shiny yeah drawn out spacey guitars in it but then you just then you just build the track and then you build the track and then you drop off the track and you do that like paused drop where it just goes wow it's like that delayed one it won't the sound fall that good. off the cliff drop. sure it won't sound that good though well, so like the fall off, of the, I've been so f- into those, like, and it's something that I'm so unfamiliar with how to generate because it's the the lushness, like how wide those um, patches are, how what like the pads, mm-hmm. how wide the pads come out, and how crazy it's modulated. Like Conroe is a good example of somebody who does a lot of that. Well, a lot of it's the uh, the side chaining too. That gives right, that, so like, that, he's, like what the, I mean, that build bounce, ram, yeah. ram, ram. like they're modulating it based on like like this. It's like a limiting thing, and it's like beyond. It's um, it's almost like behind itself. It kind of sucks in and blows out. <laughs> yeah, well, it's behind like the drum kicks, so it's like usually behind and the those, drum like, kicks. So it yeah. builds off of like already a punch in the face. It's like a punch and then a like a, a like a blast. It's like when the drum kicks hit during the dr- one of those off the cliff type drops, they're taking that wide, super loud pad and sort of just stopping it every time you hit the bass. So that that's they're just they keep looping that with the uh, attached to the bass drum. Yeah. So it's like, and it's just a unique, I don't, it's just a unique way of doing it, and I just can't wrap my head around something that crazy um and that's where you go like if you're if you're in, that's why in some ways like a sample a sample service like splice or anything like that all seems to come off to me like a crutch because you're just 
you're you're sort of rehashing stuff without having anything to say about it. Yeah, I mean, you're just taking the same sounds. The most you could do to those sounds is put effects on them. Like, you can't reshape the waveforms that are creating the sounds so to make it sound right. different or make it fit better with what you're trying to create. The the I mean, really, the only uses that it seems to me are the drums the most useful about splice is or like the the effects their patches are great their effects are good they have the rental services obviously for all of the different vsts anyway but the what's the worst there is is melody samples and that they're completely useless it's just paint by numbers you can just sort it by bpm and style and just stack this shit especially if it's from one artist if it's from like cashmere or um one of the like cashmere is like the trap artist that like everybody is like that's the that's like the trap sound that guy sort of made it and then but also um um i can't say his name future trap artist that we went and saw crane, crane. um crane's thing is is also those like um overly produced like cashmere and crane on splice like if you just took those two all of their samples all of their drums all their shit and you could just dump that in and it's almost like playing like a game like, it's almost like playing like dance dance revolution or like dj hero it's like yeah just add them some track samples and they're all at the co correct and calculated bpm they're all they are all stripped from songs where they previously worked from, yeah. with one another <laughs> just rearranging a multi-track so for me it's like more of what i would want is if i felt inspired by a certain artist's sound what you'd want to be doing is trying to craft that inside of the program with the midi with midi that you can move and control and do everything you need to do with so that's what I feel like is wrong. That's wrong. That's a wrong way of going about it. Unless again, you're making a remix, you're making a tool. Splice is amazing. Like Splice is like the Photoshop of music production, because if you need to get something done quick, if you need it for something very specific, it's always great to use. You sort that shit by BPM. Let me find like a fucking riser for just to put a riser on this so that I can move it to another track or whatever. Yeah. Change, you know, just helps me do, helps you do things if you want to make tempo changes or bridge the gap with something or create like an off, like it's sort of just a remix of something. Doing the Beetlejuice thing that I did where I was just like, I'll just find like a trap rhythm and try to sync it up at the same BPM. Just look up the original and just be like, <laughs> And then that's all it was. And then I just chop it and move it. Um, but it doesn't allow a lot of control. Woo! That was good. So it is cathartic to sort of talk about a creative process that you don't really do at all. You know, the things you want to do. Yeah. The, the limited, with the limited understanding that you have. My limited understanding, of course, is probably everything. What's this knob do? What's this knob do? See, it, it's weird that... I think I think it's weird that I find that on, on the whole, if I use software regularly, especially graphic design software and things like that, nothing really surprises me, and I don't ever feel overwhelmed. Like, I don't... I I see it through other people's eyes sometimes, like if they have no idea about like any sort of media production, not even that they have like a specialized thing. It's like, I only work in this program. It's people who literally have never used a piece of software to create something, whether that's Photoshop or Premiere or After Effects, pretty much anything in the Adobe catalog and a little bit beyond. But like, to me, it's second nature to go in to illustrator or photoshop and just make what you need to make you can do it i can do it there's you know if you want to make something it just really depends on the time with something like logic ableton live fl studio any of the big major ones 
there's no... It seems like there's a big barrier in front of me that I'm slowly chipping away at. Where right now it's like, it feels as though I'm using Logic as like GarageBand. It feels like I haven't unlocked the next sort of most comprehensive things about it. And I keep thinking in my head, like it has to be more complicated than what I'm doing. I have to be adding more steps than this. There's gotta be more in the music production process to get it to like just a mid range where it sounds okay than what I'm doing, which is, it seems like practically nothing. I'm keying shit in. I'm coming up with things. I'm just laying out general melodies. But again, it just feels like I'm in garage band. Like I'm just make it quantize, put it in place, make it quantize, move that. Oh, that starts too early. And then I play it and it's just like, yeah, that doesn't sound, this doesn't sound like a revelation. This doesn't sound like the fucking next, what I'm doing. This doesn't get me excited. What's exciting about this? Flat, shitty drums. And then it's like, what's the answer? I don't know. More stuff. Who knows? More drums, more keyboards. I'm sure someone knows. I mean, the people who know aren't going to fucking tell nobody. I mean, unless it's Crane and fucking Cashmere, in which case, then you're just going to sound like Crane and Cashmere. They're going to tell you exactly what they do for their process. Jesus Christ. Fucking Martin Garrix just uses Fruity Loops, uses FL Studio, like, like, and you look, you look at his comps in FL studio when you watch him do videos and it's literally a checkerboard of fucking filled in shit on the multi-track and it's 1500 colors and he's got it on a 27 inch monitor on one side and then another 27 for just the interface over here. He's got stacks on stacks on stacks. He's scrolling down. He's got fucking 450 layers. And I'm like, I'm, I, I was looking at this on my laptop. I'm like, what's the thing that I had the most layers in? Maybe it was the Beetlejuice thing. I think I had seven layers. Seven fucking layers of stuff. That's it. And most of the layers can be accounted for small little tiny pieces that I put in. I was going to say, how many, layer, how many of those layers could just be... How many One, of those uh, layers didn't even need to be layers? They could just some be... of the layers were just because I didn't want any effects on this. That's all it was. I moved the little fucking thing in here because I didn't want an effect on it. That's all I'm moving the layers for. You... So it doesn't even need anything. you can literally do that with uh, automation lines. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that that's the problem. Is that all of the stuff that is at the next level, I don't. I can't concern myself with because I feel like I'm just thinking, I want to think about it old style. I want to think about it. Like, how do you make music? Like you got the Jack. I mean, we've talked about this before. You've got the Jack white fucking school. And then you got the edge school. How do I make music? Well, Jack white's like, well, I can make music like this. And then, that's me. There you go. Jack White just made a song, crinkling up fucking Ziploc bags and slapping fish together. Oh, then you got the Edge, who was like, "Yeah, I built myself a supercomputer so that I could apply effects on multiple channels to all my guitars, individual strings, change out all my pickups, and fucking put all that through a Mac, and then that processes it through this." That's a guy who would probably, I would hope at some point, would fall under the same category as having too many options, don't know what to do. Or he thrives on that. He's a guy who's just like, I want every fuck. I mean, that's Trent Reznor. I want every fucking thing in the world. Yeah, but they know their options. The part of knowing your options is just, for me, like, creates anxiety. <laughs> the The moving forward with like a, a giant set of fucking tools and every single thing in the world in front of you is just like, I think I'm going to throw up. This isn't going to help me make something faster than anybody else would do it or better than I have no idea. I can't even, I don't even know how to do automation. So what is, how is this going to help me? If I can't automate the effects on a track, how am I supposed to do stuff? And yet, I was doing it 
and it's the shittiest roundabout way of chopping shit up and lowering the volume and repeating stuff and copy and paste. And it's like, that's probably not how that's supposed to be done in a multi-track environment. Here's the thing, though. It doesn't matter how it's done because as long as it sounds like what you want it to sound like, you could do it any fucking way you want, Brent. Well, like, a good... Any okay, way so... you want. Just because, just because it's not... <sighs> The perfect way to do it, no one will know because once you bounce it out, it's just an MP3 file. I, I totally get that. I think what the problem is is that I'm having the issue of like that old Seinfeld joke where it's like, cinnamon, cinnamon. Everybody asks you, what, what's in this? What makes this taste like this? Cinnamon. It's every time it's cinnamon. Cinnamon's the greatest spice in the world. If automation were cinnamon... The people out there that know how to do automation and they're bouncing out tracks and they're, they sound beautiful and there's all different sorts of fucking rising and falling and, and, and shit that modulates and all this stuff that you can do auto, you know automated within a track. Everybody's wondering, wow, what's the secret sauce to that track? What makes the production good on that track? Because... I don't know how many things I fucking watched that tell me exactly what it is. Probably nothing. Because it's the big great mystery of fucking life. How does this sound so goddamn good? What is it? Well, uh, I don't know. In the 70s, who was it? Phil Spector. Layers. Layers of fucking layers. And record them all analog. And get them perfect every time. Mm, analog. What was, it in, what was it in the 80s? Fucking Phil Collins. Phil Collins recording his drums and somebody accidentally leaves a microphone next to another microphone. Spring reverb's born. Bing bong, bing bong, bing bong, bing bong. Things are, fu- sound waves are fucking bouncing off each other. Then suddenly you end up with Su Su Studio and 500 other songs that sound exactly the same because they all got fucking spring reverb on it. And then they developed a fucking machine to do it. It wasn't just putting microphones next to other microphones anymore so they feed back into each other. It's fucking now a thing that you can apply to a track to make it uniquely sound like the 80s. Do you want it to sound like Peter Gabriel fucking Phil Collins drums? You put a basic spring reverb on it and it gives you that. Fucking burning down the house shit. But I digress. I'm just saying... That the great mystery of music production to me is, and I mean this kind of applies to like lo-fi or indie bands, how simple can it be until it's not good? And what makes it good then? That's the Jack White argument. Or how complicated can it be until it goes bad? Until it's too complicated? Or until you're over... I mean, the the Bleachers was a band that I was talking about earlier. I was listening to a review of of his record on fucking The Needle Drop. And he was like, this record is overproduced as fuck. Does it really mean that it's bad? Well, it's good songwriting. Some of it. And some of the way that he does things, you know, interestingly within a song or layers vocals is very interesting. But it's overproduced as fuck. Everything's... real wide i don't know if that's good and then you got me over here going boop 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 no that's good <laughs> maybe i'll hang on let me record that and going through and playing obviously you know the other thing is too is it's like i'm not testing you know i have my monitors but it's like i'm testing this stuff on headphones going back over to my desk plugging it in trying it in different ways hearing it in different ways and it's like when I bounce this out, is it going to sound like shit garbage because I didn't do enough, or is it going to be simple and clever? I don't. Who the fuck knows? You can you can be like Sylvanesso. Sylvanesso is a great example of fucking two people that just sounds like they're on a fucking monotron, like a monotron and a goddamn um, uh, fucking just a rolling nine oh nine. Just that's that's what we have since it was like chip chip tunes with a lady vocal over the top of it and it's real it's got a real cacophony to it and it's all over the fucking map and it doesn't sound like they're doing it to a click track it's just 
building these crazy fucking layers on top of each other that are all happen to be like saws, the most basic saw and the most basic fucking starts to the no patches on them. No effects, no nothing. It's just robot music. So what do you do there? You got Sylvan S.O., girl who makes fucking awesome little quirky little indie tracks with what you do is analogness. you make what you want to make and try stop trying to emulate everybody else you make what you want to make baby the the inherent problem in that is that i haven't i've set out to make something that's already been there but do it i guess i don't know if i would be doing it better or just doing it faithfully what if instead you just do it like you want to do it instead of limiting that's that's too much limit you're putting too much limit on yourself right where you're just literally trying to remake the stuff that's already been made that's not what you want to do i so i mean in in a way though i think what my, that's really that's really what you want to do because what's the point no, of even no, no. doing that no i i think what what i really want is i, I want to create music out of this experience that um references a type of music that i really like which artists have done like a good example is paramore's shift from um sparkly upscale pop punk uh, pop punk right sparkly upscale pop punk sometimes a little earlier with a little bit more like uh chutzpah on it to blondie and it's very easy to hear them listening to their surroundings at the time with bands happening like Pale Waves, the 1975, that are also making pretty significant reference to this earlier era. If you turned off the vocals on some of the tracks on the 1975 second record, it sounds like NXS. Um... Here's the thing, though. It sounds like the 1975. It sounds like Paramore. Right. You're like, oh, that's Paramore. Are you trying to make something that's like, oh, that's Brent? Or are you trying to make something that's... Wow, I guess I never heard this song. When, when did this come out? When you listen to Hideaway. Um, that sounds like... Show me love, or it's it sounds I was gonna like say, finally by C. C. Peniston. I, but I was gonna say, is that like the whole point of you like making a playlist that's like, I bet you don't know who this is, is because it all just sounds the fucking same. And I guess that's a problem with that music. It's like, I've yeah, I don't never, know what I don't know what that is because it's one of the hundred songs that came out at that time that this person made, that this person made, but it all sounds like it came off the same record from the same people. I can. I can only tell you a few artists from the period of 90s techno and when that was popular at the time. I can only tell you probably five artists that were unique and that you could distinguish from other artists of that era and the rest of it was probably trying to be them. So like the ones that you can kind of point to are like Ace of Bass, Technotronic, um, Ace of Bass, Technotronic, uh, and there's like there's two other ones I'd have to look at a list to tell you kind of what, but everything else. Oh, after so, that. so you're telling me the two that you can name are two that probably anyone can name? Well, uh, yes, because they so have like, a distinct sound, LaBouche and everyone, is one. but like. What happens is is they all start to bleed together because, like I said, you have those four artists that establish. That's the point, too, is that there's a there's a there's a group or a group of artists in the 90s that established whatever this is. Yeah, I that's something that I don't really know or I'm not really aware of, which actually could be a real good research project on my part. Who invented 90s techno? Who invented the sound of some Swede? That that's it. Probably very could it very well could be if it wasn't the other way around. 
like if if it weren't like a, a western exchange where it's like you know we do one thing and then all the brit then the brit pop shit blows up because they heard some stuff in america that was like wow we're in the 90s and this sounds great <laughs> So um, 2008, so 2008, I, the, the poet I, once, a poet once said. <laughs> I totally agree. I think with the idea that, you know, maybe saying that, cause like saying the word revival or saying the word, like, um, a tribute to goes into kind of a gross area. That's very true that like if my i i think what it was was just i've very recently been pretty inspired by that music in particular um and thought that there wasn't enough out there or the best version of this out there that i thought i could make like the effort is like to make like a you know this style of music like awesome um, but the, you might be right in the sense that it might be a little bit too limiting and I might want to maybe try to reach further into other styles or other techniques or, you know, just let it go as, and be what it is. I could let it, I could let it go and be what it is. I just think it, it'll probably take longer, <laughs> probably take longer to make if I was just like, well, what's saying that this nineties techno song couldn't have like a huge fucking rise and then like a halftime drop or some weird arpeggiation like the 80s why couldn't i put, why couldn't i take the the tenets of 90s te techno and have some big washy fucking iran delayed synths or some shit like that in there that's like uniquely 80s is it probably just maybe going to be old sounding that's probably a good assessment that's probably the aim is like kind of want it to sound 80s 90s of its time i want it to sound of its time but also have you know different elements modern elements now it sounds too abstract now it just sounds like a guy who doesn't fucking know what his direction is or what what, what it is i guess that's cool for it to not have a direction or be anything just Something. Excuse me. I'm a little congested. Ew. Ew. Um. I think. Uh, I think that's good. We can. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll. I'll. We'll do. We'll do our. Our. Our seminal segment. I think we can do that. But I'll. I'll probably take the lead on it since oh, you've been done. thoroughly we're engrossed. By doing our seminal. Oh, I thought we were done. Done. Oh, if you want to be done, done, we can fucking wait until you actually play some goddamn games. See, that would be nice. Because I did would plan, you like to on, pl plan on playing a couple this week. Well, I'll do a mini one then. How's I'll that? do a mini one. I'll do a five minute. I'll do a five minute or a little mini mini, oh, mini blur. Hey, lately. Brian, you playing good games lately? <laughs> dance, monkey, dance. Um, I so uh the one that i was that i've been recently kind of obsessed with i've been playing pretty much non-stop for eh, probably a week more than a week is golf story uh which which scratches incidentally my itch for the olden days of pokemon but with really none of the really none of the collectathon there it definitely has its moments grinding. of collectathoning the grinding yeah, you're really not grinding in here. Your your skill tree is very linear, and you feel like you're you're upgrading at the right times. And there's not very much in the way of like an impact to gameplay if you don't like do a certain amount of shit. You kind of just you're going through it. You're you got how long your drive is, and then you can update things below that that are just like spin how much your ball spins. It's like just skill based stuff. And then, um, but once again, you never ever feel like you can't play the game or you can't complete a certain section without being at a certain, there's no levels. You just, you know, up, upgrade. You get, and I mean, you have some item upgrades. It's not, it's not um, overwhelming. 
You're, it's not it's not like a hardcore RPG where it's like Jesus Christ I'm looking at up arrows and down arrows to figure out if my fucking ATT BEF fucking everything else is in order and I don't it's, you know it's not destiny I'm not trying to figure out like how the fuck what direction I want to go in and what class I am you're just a guy golfing you eventually get some better clubs you get to drive the ball farther you get a little bit more control over the ball and then you open up a couple skills that are useful for like you know little sections of time or but I think the main part of golf story that's probably the best thing about it is that um, the story uh, is self-deprecating um, and a little self-aware. It realizes that from an RPG perspective that it is pretty simple. <laughs> and they're kind of talking about that sort of backhandedly throughout the whole thing. Um, and also the, the characters are kind of cool. They're all very... um, Cheeky. Yeah. Like, they reference... Like, it's it's very Pokemon because they sort of create the weird dialogue type of thing that that seems a little stiff. Yeah. It seems a little stiff. It seems a little hacky. um, But it's still funny. You never find yourself audibly laughing. It's just fucking little... Little, little oh, that's that's kind of funny. That's a little oh. clever what they did there, but that's just enough for you to really appreciate how they're moving the game along and some of the weird storylines. Like you end up going into like a, you end up going into a like a, an area that's all cavemen. They talk like Neanderthals, and like you're golfing on like this like real shitty course that's just got rocks and fucking skulls and giant fucking bones sticking out of the ground and. It's all mode like shit, and it's all dark and crusty. Good. That's like one area, and then the other one you're going is like where you're in like fucking. I mean, you're in like a fucking mountain, and the winds are blowing at fucking thirty miles an hour, and you gotta hit your ball like to the right to bring it the fuck around left to hit the hole. Um. There's like snow areas and all these other different things, and the and the. The fetchy challenges aren't don't seem overwhelming. They're pretty cool. They don't there there's enough variety to where it doesn't seem like you really want to be golfing in it. That's what you really want to be doing, mm-hmm. at least in my experience, is like I could sit down and play for a solid hour of just golfing in this style, because it's just top down. Super pixely. You got the fucking bar. It goes back and forth. You stop the bar for power. You come back and you stop it for for a slice or for you know what direct you know it's gonna like yeah. slice or whatever. Comes back. You hit it. You get the satisfying fucking clunk of that bitch going like the biggest drive you could possibly do. And then you know the mecha- the the physics are actually really good. They feel. You feel very satisfied playing the golfing aspect of it. So, like I said, you could just—I could just—you just remove that. Give me a ten-dollar, fucking like super linear, like Angry Birds style game. That's just that. It's beautiful. But then you just have the added bonus of having a not super arduous Pokemon Quest style storyline and items and you know mechanics. That's just icing on the cake. Simple, sexy little pixely golf game with fucking awesome story on it. That's the that should be on the fucking cover box. Right on the box. Right on the old digital box. It's bigger than that is my bigger than the golf screen. story title card. It's just a fucking paragraph. <laughs> this game is the greatest game I've ever played in history, and it's the it's like got all of those little award crests on it like on the can film set with the little, little looks like the uh the was it the batman years. arkham city i think it was the game of the year edition <laughs> box <laughs> 10 out of 10 ign like, uh, it's like the what, game's what been what out game for fucking 27 this? years and you just released it as a greatest hit yeah i'm sure it's gonna rack up some fucking awards you don't gotta put every one on oh, it oh no i had every one on it oh my god um but like yeah, I that's uh, I, it's very relaxing. It's just uh, oh, and the other thing I just want to quickly tell you is I was kind of upset and hoping now that iconoclasts 
comes to Switch. So I'm like, that's built for this. This is the console to have it on. Yeah. It's the Nindy should be the fucking Nindy of the week, dude. I don't know. If, I don't know if they plan on it. Yeah, that's a problem. I, don't, I haven't seen anything. It's I was because I was box. Ever since um, yeah, that's weird too. Even if I mean that's can't be that hard to do. Um, but when you were telling me that, I was just like, oh, I mean, it's like dead cells. Okay, awesome. That's hopefully gonna happen. And then it's then it's you know then it was confirmed. And then you got. Some of these other ones that are coming out that I see footage of, just the little pixely bullshit games, just the platform. I mean, that's those are fucking going like crazy now. The fucking pixel platformer, dude. And I mean, we still had it at the Meat Boy times, but Jesus Christ, it's gotten better, bigger, better. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say better? Better again. <laughs> Owl, the owl boys of the world are becoming like the fucking like behemoths of gaming. It's like wow, these are like amazing experiences that nobody can now be cynical about because it's they're good. You can't just be like, oh great, another pixel art because yeah, there's some fucking good ones out there now. Anyway, video game journalism hour, <laughs> or what seemed like an hour, yeah, I can probably course. end on. Oh. I have to piss too, like a racehorse. Yeah, me too. Too much coffee and fucking water. So, if you uh, have to also piss like a racehorse and you need something to listen to while you're sit squatting down on the toilet, the links in this, to the audio oh, versions of this podcast are available below this video. In the description. In the description. So if you'd like to uh, if you'd like to release your bodily fluids to this podcast, be my guest. Download it on iTunes. Get it on other stuff. Subscribe to it. I don't. Right, care. I, I really don't know gotta go. Do. All right. <laughs> that is the Jacket Off podcast. Two people got to piss. Get out of here.